very proud to present uh, Michael Blatherwick, who will be giving a presentation on the Rural Policy Learning Commons and our panel. And Michael Blatherwick uh, works as a community outreach coordinator, coordinator with the Rural Development Institute at Brandon University. And he's also a liaison officer with the Rural Policy Learning Commons. Uh, Michael is currently enrolled in the Masters of Rural Development at Brandon University, and his thesis focuses on the relationship between uh, recreation infrastructure and community sustainability. Uh, Sorry, that's what it says, yes. Uh, with the emphasis on uh, population retention and in immigration. In migration, yeah. In migration. Uh, and having been raised in northern Manitoba, uh, with several years working experience uh, with the province of Manitoba's recreation and regional services branch. And Michael is passionate about helping support uh, and development community uh, leadership capacity and sustainability. So let's give a warm welcome to Michael. Michael and guests today. Um, we have a couple things on the go here at the moment. Uh, for those that are in the room, I thank you for coming to our session today. And uh, we hope that the information that we present is both informative and something that you can take forward. Uh, we also have a handful of technology in the corner of the room recording this. So um, just for privacy concerns, the only people that are on camera at the moment are the panel and myself. If you really want to be on TV, feel free to streak through the front of the room and you will be the next YouTube sensation. But uh, more seriously, I'd like to thank uh, anyone who's tuning in on uh, Periscope and through Zoom.us to our RPLC network. Uh, this uh, presentation will be available online on the RPLC website and uh, we encourage anyone who is interested to learn more about the RPLC also to follow up with uh, myself or any of the panelists. Uh, at the end of the presentation, we'll uh, outline where you can find our information. So, that's that. And thanks for the intro. If I knew it was going to be so long, I might have wrote it, written it a little bit shorter. It's a little bit embarrassing. But um, I am actually really excited to be here. I grew up in northern Manitoba. Now, being at a conference that also uh, takes into consideration Arctic issues, I know that northern is a bit of a perspective. I live in Brandon, Manitoba now, which is in the prairies, so when I talk about an 800 kilometer community north of Brandon, they think that's north. But I know that there's even more north in Arctic. Uh, but similarly, um, the issues that we find in rural do vary. So we were talking uh, before the presentation on you know, what is rural and what is remote or what is northern. And this session necessarily isn't meant to kind of go through those issues, but understand that they do exist, and we hope to highlight how the RPLC network um, can help um, perhaps improve um, life for those that do live in areas that they consider rural or northern or Arctic. So this is uh, from where I grew up with, this, which is Boreal Forest, um, and I miss it. Uh, my folks still live there, so I go there uh, quite frequently in the summers. I'd like to acknowledge a couple of people, uh, Jeanette Doucette from Aikens, Melanie Paulson from the Arctic Institute of North America. Uh, our RPLC network, there's a handful of people who have helped put some information together. Uh, this presentation in particular is not all my work and uh, even some of the script, um, people like Kale Passmore and Sarah Woods helped uh, put together. Uh, so we're live broadcasting on Periscope and Zoom.us and I encourage, like I said, anyone, to, if they want more information, we'd be happy to get in touch. So, here's a little bit of an agenda for today's um, session. I'm going to talk about the RPLC network, uh, the challenges and the solutions that we have. Uh, we have a great panel from all over uh, Canada and from the U.S. Uh, who have all had um, a little bit to do with the RPLC in one capacity or another. Um, maybe I'll have you wave. Lindemar Campus Flores is from the University of Montreal. She's with our Human Capital and Migration team. Uh, we also have Maggie McMichael from Dalhousie University. 
She's uh, with our governance team. Uh, Laura Reiser, she is from the University of Northern British Columbia, and she's with our infrastructure and services team. And we have Henry Penn on the outside uh, from the University of Fairbanks, Alaska. And similarly, he's uh, really interested in the infrastructure and services team. I'll explain a little bit more about the teams and how the RPLC is uh, structured. And also, in a little while, we'll actually get to hear from our uh, panel on their experiences and research. So some of the session topics that we're going to cover is how our panelists got involved with research, how they fit within a research team, adjustments between maybe rural and northern research, and maybe they can share a couple of stories. Um, also, how research is meaningful towards helping guide policy, and any insights on uh, career opportunities in the future for any um, aspiring researchers out in the audience today. Um, also, this is meant to be a little bit of an interactive session, so if anyone has a question, please you know, stop me. Um, it doesn't hurt for me to take a breath every now and then. And uh, feel free to ask myself or any of the panelists questions. Again, it's uh, great to have you here, and we're happy to be here. Any questions before I start? Very good? Great. So, some of the rural challenges, and like I said, I'm not going to define rural, because everybody has a different definition sometimes. But I think it's a broad picture, and everyone will agree, that there is sometimes a geographical isolation for people who live in rural communities as compared to the urban centers. Access to health care, education, and basic services, such as even food and water, are sometimes a challenge. Uh, the effects of climate change on resource-based economies, especially I grew up in a mining community, but uh, you know, agriculture, fishing, uh, mining, are, are all uh, affected by climate change, sometimes more so than urban centers. Access to information and technology. Um, in the earlier session today, we were hearing about how when the internet goes down, the store goes down, and a lot of um, services to the community go down. And this is a challenge for a lot of people, not only in the Arctic, but even in some parts of northern provinces, Manitoba, etc. cetera. Uh, there is a tend for modern urbanization and city-centric planning to occur. And this urban-focused decision makers, many of them do reside in, in urban settings. So when they're putting together policy, sometimes, perhaps, the rural considerations aren't taken into account. Um, you know, you'd even look at some of our major uh, institutions or, or research centers are all within urban centers. So sometimes there tends to be a little bit of a disconnect between rural and urban. And as such, um, we hope that this, uh, the needs of the rural people aren't left in the dust. Even with the recent, it's funny, today is November 4th, and, and this morning we were watching um, Justin Trudeau get sworn in as the new Prime Minister. And I know there's been a lot of talk about how the Liberals uh, really focused on an urban vote because there's a growing population of people that are moving to urban centers. Historically, uh, Canada has been a country that has somewhat defined itself by its rural life and also we also know that Canada is a resource-based economy and uh, even though you might get more votes by focusing all of your efforts on urban, the, the lifeblood for many rural researchers such as myself depends on um, policies that do help rural citizens and so we see a need that exists. So some of the solutions in a culmination of more than a decade of work between the Canadian Rural Revitalization Foundations, uh, the Rural Development Institute, and the International Comparative Rural Policy Studies Program, um, they came up with the RPLC. They were awarded a $2.5 million funding partnership from SHRC, the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, and this funding is to um, last over seven years. So, when people ask about what the RPLC is, I handed out a two-page um, fact sheet for what it is and it is not. Uh, we'll also make that fact sheet available online, and I encourage people to visit the website where uh, you can learn everything you want to know about um, the RPLC. But in a nutshell, if, if one of my friends who isn't a researcher were to ask me what is the RPLC, I would say it's a network. It is, and just as the statement says, um, Founders, organizers, and members have sought to strengthen comparative research collaboration among faculty members, students, policymakers, and on-the-ground practitioners. The goal 
is to develop new solutions, retrain, retain traditional practices, and foster innovative solutions to the problems facing modern, rural, and northern life. So, in a void of information, the purpose a little bit of the RPLC is to serve as a, a point of um, focus for anyone who is looking for information on best practices or um, policy development that affects rural, hopefully the RPLC can help bring that information together so that our decision makers can have the best up-to-date information. And this little graphic helps put your head around it a little bit. There are nine countries that are involved with the RPLC, uh, Canada, the States, Mexico, we have Eng uh, England, Scotland, Ireland, Spain, and Italy. Um, the, uh, this is a good summary. We have 12 teams, mostly five research teams, and seven knowledge mobilization teams. I'll explain this a little bit more. We have over 30 partners, so this includes institutions, universities, governments, uh, research stations over 60 individuals, faculty, policy organizations, international organizations. And uh, we also host, aside from collaborating information, we also do broadcast webinars out to the general public um, to a wide, wide audience. So this little graph here kind of breaks it down. Now, if you're into flowcharts, this is the slide for you, which is awesome. We have our five research theme teams. So human capital, natural resources, governance, infrastructure and services, and our newest one, which is transformations in indigenous communities. Now of these five research themes, of course there is a lot of little overlap every now and then, but with each research team, there'll be a, a team lead and a variety of researchers that are interested in that area that might be doing research. The idea is to pull all that information together and help bring that forward to the RPLC. Some of this might include personal exchanges, policy for institutes, distance learning, publications, digital information hub, and social media. And I'll show you on the website, which is the next slide. So this is just one example of where information can be found. Our PLC is not just a website. This is just a platform to help share information. The RPLC is a network, which is more virtual than anything, and it's about those interconnectedness between practitioners and researchers and government officials. The website does serve as a platform where things can be posted. Uh, there's a number of things in our network, news and events, um, career opportunities, call for proposals, conferences, events, all this stuff we do kind of use the website as a platform. Uh, we have a social stream on rural matters, uh, which just as an example might include a recent news story recent publication or recent research that's happening. Uh, the website is about two years old, which is about as long as, as our PLC has been in existence. Like I said, we are a seven year project, so there's still things that we are looking to develop as far as the network is concerned. One idea, for example, is if you are interested in uh, poverty or, or housing in, in communities, uh, it would be really great to tailor your interests to be specific to that area. So you might want to follow a certain feed, similar to a Twitter feed, where if anything new or new research or someone's uh, come out with a, a new paper or there's a conference on, on your topic of interest, you'll get that information so it'll help you uh, with maybe research that you're doing or also find ways or people that might be of interest for you to collaborate with. You might be able to follow researchers that are doing work in, in an area that you find interesting and really help make that connectiveness. Because we're all busy, politicians are busy, researchers are busy, students are busy, and the purpose a little bit of the RPLC is to help bring that information together because we all know that the information is out there, but that connectiveness of being able to contribute, as Henry put it, and also get something back from it is something that is of value and hopefully will guide people towards best practices, uh, especially in regards to policy. So that's a website, that's just an example of what the RPLC has done. Another example is uh, reports and collaboration of research efforts, such as the State of Rural Canada, which just came out uh, in partnership with the Canadian Rural Revitalization Foundation. 
Um, the report is on the website, and uh, I encourage you to have a look at it. But just as an example, it does come out with recommendations, which could be useful for governments to uh, make suggestions as far as policy is concerned. Many of our um, colleagues have made presentations to ministers of a variety of provinces um, on certain issues such as migration, which is a hot topic in the news today. Um, and these uh, up-to-date, current um, research topics uh, are being seen as being useful, especially to elected officials who may not be as um, knowledgeable or, or in-depth or up-to-date with some of the most modern uh, research efforts. So uh, that's where we see the RPLC really helping not only just a theoretical framework work of where people get together, but actually being able to deliver something that can put meaningful action into place and help people in communities. Uh, ISERPS, I mentioned, is another effort that has been going on for, this is the 13th year coming up. It is an international conference. Uh, faculty, students, um, professionals, government officials um, come together on an annual basis. This year's conference is coming up in Ireland, La or rather last year was in Ireland. This year is coming up in Fairbanks, Alaska. And the focus of it is an international comparative opportunity on regional policy. Uh, you'll get people from all over the globe on uh, similar interests. Um, just for example, when I was in Ireland last year, it was very interesting to see how their uh, agriculture-based economy, which is mostly based on the dairy industry, has changed with the uh, recent recession, especially with the uh, challenges that Ireland and some of the other countries have had being part of the EU, and uh, hearing about how their leader program has helped revitalize and help encourage young farmers to potentially get back into agriculture because many farmers are starting to retire. Um, to help retain that industry is very interesting. Almost like a microcosm for the agriculture industry, something that was useful for all people who attended, because of course we all have an agricultural sector in some form or another. And uh, these opportunities to meet with other international um, researchers and knowledge people was an experience that I thoroughly enjoyed and, and recommend. So this year's coming up in July 14th to the 26th. Uh, the theme of the conference is Northern Perspectives on Global Challenges. Uh, it'll cover a, a number of issues, some of uh, which I've already touched on. Some other examples of collaboration, um, and I'm not saying that the RPLC is the uh, reason that these happen, um, but we do have people that are involved in some very <coughs> notable projects. Uh, such as when books come out, uh, Philomena de Lima, who's part of our human capital and migration team, edited this new book uh, with Andrew Copas and was awarded the Regional Science Association Award. We also have uh, our own Laura Riser here today, and I know she did work on a new book that is coming out in January, and she can touch on it in a little bit, on doing community-based research uh, perspectives from the field. So it's not only of use to existing researchers, but also some perspective researchers as well. And that's kind of the point, that we're trying to get people together to talk about what are the best ways that we can move knowledge forward. So here are the main goals, and then I'll pass it over to our panel. Um, the RPLC aims to enhance prosperity by identifying and analyzing policy options relevant to rural and northern places, evaluating these options in the context of national and international policy innovations, and building leadership capacity among rural and northern researchers policymakers and practitioners. So that's a little bit of a touch on what the RPLC is, but it's really about the people. So this is a perfect spot, and I'm gonna turn it over to our panel um, to talk about how they got involved with research, and they can tell you a little bit more about that. So I'll hand it over. Um, so I'm Laura, and uh, I grew up in a rural area outside of Prince George. I grew up in Pine View, um, and I think that uh, I think sometimes in rural and remote uh, areas that don't necessarily have a, an academic institution uh, um, such as UMBC, which we have now, uh, there tends to be a bit of a, a history um, where people were able to get high-paying jobs with very little education, and so research wasn't really a part of the normal landscape. 
people didn't always look at it as a potential academic career. And so I think that that is something that's really interesting and is starting to really bud and take place as people are starting to see the opportunities in research, uh, whether they want to be academics or whether they just want to be um, someone working for government or industry or even business and, and really use research in their day-to-day -day activities. Um, so I actually kind of got involved. I'd done a couple of internships, one with the United Nations Development Program in Mongolia, um, and then a, another one uh, uh, with the Central uh, and Eastern Europe. Um, and one of the questions that was always asked of me um, is how Mongolia really compares to the prairie landscape. And even though, you know, I, I had been you know, to the Peace River region in northern BC and been to Nova Scotia and Quebec, I'd never really been to the prairies. And so when I came back and I started doing my master's degree at UMBC, there was a fantastic opportunity to get involved with this very large national um, research project called the New Rural Economy Project. Uh, so it uh, had 32 sites in every province and territory across the country. And uh, it was a really valuable um, learning experience because we're also starting to see much more calls for collaborative and even interdisciplinary research. Uh, so, um, you know, I think it was a very important uh, lesson. Um, do you want me to speak as well about how we fit into the research team? Sure. Now? Or, um, so, you know, I think that uh, it was something where we really had to do um, a lot of homework uh, right early on, um, because a lot of the effort you put in when you join a research project will pay dividends later on. So um, sometimes students don't always get a copy of the proposal. They just kind of get hired on as a research assistant, and they, they just want to know that what they're going to be doing that summer. Uh, but it really does pay off if you're able to get a copy of the proposal, find out who's all involved, what are all the different theoretical um, conceptual frameworks that are involved, uh, because that's really going to allow you to be able to connect with other people uh, that are involved with the project and to be able to engage in conversations and be able to do other types of research tasks because of course you want to be more than just a data collector. You want to be able to develop a breadth of research skills. So that was always something that we stressed early on was that um, you also want to make sure that uh, you're looking for a really good fit. Uh, so just finding out the backgrounds of other people uh, that are involved, especially when you have a, a huge national, uh, or even in the case of the RPLC, an international network of researchers. Uh, it's very important to try to figure out who's doing what, what their roles and responsibilities are, and how that really compares to what you're doing as well. So that you can try to create some synergies and even create some opportunities. Um, we, uh, even through the New Rural Economy Project, we had students from Quebec come out to BC to do research. Uh, we worked with uh, David Bruce's students at uh, Mount Allison University, collaborating quite a bit. And so that really exposes uh, students <coughs> to different disciplines, different methodologies, and different ways of doing things, and also strengthens networks that can lead to better job or career or study aspects down the road. So that's uh, something that's always um, quite important. Um, always, uh, we always advise people to make sure that they're part of a good communication loop. So of course, Michael was talking about the Twitter, which is fantastic, because I even saw on the, uh, on the slide here that people were promoting uh, you know, different research opportunities uh, through Twitter. Um, but whether it's being part of email lists, uh, being part of workshops, conferences, uh, team meetings, all of that is really important because if you're not up to date, you might feel that you're lost uh, or not able to engage in, dis in discussions, and that can really impact the opportunities that you have to be able to do things, um, whether it be to participate in writing proposals, um, you know, starting to uh, uh, design um, projects, uh, and like side spin-off pro um, projects, uh, and even collaborate with different stakeholders. Um, so that's uh, something that uh, is always really important. And again, also to really set some good early learning goals. Uh, so some people might decide that they want to get into academia down the road, and that's fantastic. Then they'll want to make sure that they understand the entire research pro um, process and try to figure out ways that they can develop a breadth of skills. 
Um, where some people might say, you know what, academia is not going to be my thing, but I would like to get a summer job during research and just understand what the process is all about. Uh, and so that when they are done and they go to work for the provincial government, um, or whether they're working for industry, business, or a, a nonprofit, they can be better consumers of research uh, and, uh, and use that to inform their planning um, of their infrastructure, their services, and programs. Um, uh, and uh, I guess the last thing is always to emphasize to students to um, just be more than a, a data collector. Um, you know, I think it's really too often, uh, whether it be at the undergraduate level or the graduate level even, um, that students become involved and they basically are doing the surveys and they're entering the data and then that's where it stops. Uh, and I think um, we have to do a, a much better job of incorporating um, uh, students uh, into the knowledge mobilization activities uh, and, uh, and into the writing uh, and other things as well so that they do have a better understanding um, of the entire research process. That's right. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I, I will say hello. My name, name is uh, uh, I will say being shocked because I came from Mexico and I have a, a particular idea about Canada. Oh, yeah. And when I started reading, I, I was invited to work in a small research uh, project with a professor that was working with uh, temporary foreign workers in the agricultural sector. So came down to see what are doing this year. I, I couldn't believe that because I really, really uh, believe that Canada was a democratic place. And we are doing the right things, ethical things. So when I started reading, for me, it was really a shock. First of all, uh, I was uh, I made all my education here, so I uh, I thought, well, uh, I I will do as I didn't see anything. So I decided to continue with my master's. And, uh, I uh, did it in uh, intercultural studies. And after I uh, to continue, I'm now I'm in my second year in my PhD. And my subject is uh, exactly the foreign workers. And uh, going through different networks, I met Bill uh, He was the coordinator of those uh, days, uh, 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 with prosperity networking. And after that, uh, he started uh, this beautiful uh, DLC. So I'm working now with the human capital and migration team. And I think that uh, I, I had a possibility, as you said, that uh, some students, they, they go on board because they need a job. I think that, yes, it's good, but he says, well, I'm doing this, but I really don't like research. So I think that the first thing, the thing is, is to like it to really believe that, that uh, what we are doing is going to, to have an impact. And I think that's a really first thing I would say. And uh, if I talk about uh, uh, how, how to, or the second point, I don't remember, how to fit in. I think that we need two things. I think that we need to learn, as we say in music, to be a, a, a second violin player in violin. But also we need to have leadership because sometimes we need to to present to to uh, uh, especially to trust ourselves that we have ideas. I think that when a professor uh, accepts that you are working with uh, uh, his or her, is because they believe that you have something to to contribute uh, to this, the the field. So uh, for me, uh, it has been a, a, a very interesting opportunity to go uh, to different places to have the possibility of exchange with uh, another uh, people who are working in the same uh, subject or different but we can we can find the, uh, the, the point where we can meet so I uh, for me that's a, a very important thing as, as, as you said before I, I think that uh, when we come and we see what's happening is when after when uh, uh, we will appreciate data that is everywhere. But for me, the most important thing in this uh, particular uh, network we were talking at the moment, it's that uh, that we can influence policy. I think that, you know, most of you, I think you are, you are involved with this, uh, that the main idea of doing research is that we want to give 
the, the tools to the policy makers so they can really see that this is happening and we believe that this can be the solution. So I think that's, for me, the most uh, interesting thing to work in this. Yeah, the yeah, thing I'd like to, you know, especially for researchers that are on the ground level, they have that perspective that sometimes those policy makers might not have, so they know it's a value to us and they're making informed decisions. That's great. Uh, okay, uh, Maggie? Sure, my name's Maggie, um, and I just finished my master's at Dalhousie. And I first got involved in research in my undergrad, just kind of, uh, as Lenore was mentioning, looking for a summer job. And I ended up getting a summer research grant um, to do independent research there. And from that, my supervisor said, oh, you should go and do a master's thesis. So that's kind of what got me started. It wasn't necessarily you know, my love for research, but I kind of enjoyed it. And he suggested I go into it. And at that time, and continuing, there's been a lot of conversations and work in Nova Scotia basically that Nova Scotia is in a time of crisis. Uh, we need to come back from economic stagnation, population decline, and there's been a lot of conversation about rural versus urban, and one of the big things that kept coming up again and again was youth and youth attraction and retention, and this was all really very near and dear to me as I was a young person who really loved my province, and so that's what kind of inspired me to do the research that I did, which was looking at young people the trend and moved into rural communities in Nova Scotia. And my hope with that was to be able to at least on a small level impact that conversation and some of the attitudes towards rural Nova Scotia and Nova Scotia in general. Um, and so this kind of segues into the research team question because in both of those experiences in my undergrad and in my master's I wasn't part of the research team, I was just my own self, I had independent funding, I had a question that I thought was interesting and went and did it, which had really a lot of good things about it, there was a lot of flexibility, I could you know, go where I wanted with it, um, but since then, talking to other people who've been part of research teams and now I'm actually a research assistant um, at Mount St. Vincent University on a research team. There's a lot of things I think that you miss out on by being an independent researcher, not connected with the team. Um, so, um, particularly looking for support, and that's something maybe if you're an independent um, researcher being part of a network like RPLC, even if you don't have other researchers being your research program, there's other researchers across Canada and internationally that are working on similar questions or using similar on their expertise, which I think is a really a great aspect of the RPLC. Um, and also in terms of, kind of jumping ahead to the, the impacting policy, but I think that there's a lot more opportunity when you're connected and part of the team to influence policy than just as one person trying to answer one small question if you're building off of other research and having a conversation with other researchers, so there's a lot more potential to impact. Last but not least, Henry. Hey. I can say, um, my name is Henry. Uh, I am currently at the University of Alaska Fairbanks in the uh, Water and Environmental Research Centre. Um, I'm a research assistant and a PhD student up there. Uh, I'm originally from England. Uh, that's where I did my undergrad and my masters in in civil engineering. And the sort of the process by which I got into research was sort of. Um, almost sort of a, a process of elimination. So halfway through my undergrad degree, I was able to go and take a year out and work on a, on a construction site as an engineer. And, and pretty much within the first couple of weeks, I realized I, I hated it. And uh, that it was going to be a really difficult year working working on a construction site and, uh, and doing those kind of uh, hours and tasks and stuff. And uh, when I got back, I realized that it wasn't, it was the sort of that kind of engineering that it was that I didn't enjoy not engineering itself. So I started looking around engineering that I did enjoy and I found drinking water and sanitation um, subject areas quickly became interesting to me. So I was able to follow that through into a master's um, working for a, a utility company in the UK. And, and I also was not a huge fan of that project either. 
um, I found that working with large utility companies was uh, interesting in that the research that they were wanting to do was uh, innovative and, and interesting and using a lot of uh, activities with uh, different stakeholders, governments at various different levels, the public, uh, regulators, um, but ultimately the, 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 uh, the motivation was, was monetary, was looking after shareholders and the, the FTSE 100 position and all these kind of things. Um, so that sort of led me to want to work with work within a project, work within a, an organization that I could understand what I was doing was going to make at least um, influence people making a difference in nothing, if, if not making a difference in of itself. So um, so I worked with a number of different universities and then ultimately ended up in, in Fairbanks looking at drinking water and drinking water infrastructure and then sort of the broader understanding of water security <coughs> excuse me, in, in rural Alaska. Um, and I think, the, I think the lesson that I learned coming through all of that and sort of how I wanted to get into research was just to keep following, following the path that interests you. And that will, for me, it led to research. I have friends who we didn't, and they're equally as invested and interested in the subjects that they're, that they're working on and studying it. And then in terms of you know, how that helps you fit into a research team, I think the big thing that I would encourage anybody in a research team to do is sort of, is firstly to own the subject that you're researching. If you're there in a research team and you know if you're the you're the water guy, you're the energy person, you're the agriculture person, well then you're probably on that research team to be to be that person, you know, even if you're the undergrad researcher or the or the master's researcher on a, on a large international project, you're you're there for a you're there for a reason and I would emphasize that that's because you have the knowledge to go forward and, and push that. Even if you've got to pick up a bunch of knowledge really, really quickly to maintain your position in that group, I think it's still something that you should be proud of and engaged in. <clears throat> and then the other thing is I think, and we've, we've, we've touched on it a couple, couple times already, is to, is to really try and break down the problem that you're, you're working on in terms of who else is involved in the project. So the project that I'm currently involved on now is a, is a water, energy, and food nexus um, project. And I'm coming at it from a water angle, but there are people on the, on the ground that are coming at the, sort of the, the underlying things from a from a food and energy standpoint. So I've spent a decent amount of time going through and trying to understand their point of view. And it's become increasingly obvious to me that energy and water actually have a, you know, almost a symbiotic relationship, which I wouldn't have appreciated if I'd have just stuck from my corner of the ring of, of water and not expanded out and gone and gone to talk to my research people and ask them for what they're reading and this kind of thing. So I think being complementary to your research team is, is a big part of fitting them. Right. I'm just going to do a touch little thing just in case there are some people that logged in a little later. So this is the RPLC presentation and we're here at the ACUS conference in Calgary, November 4th, 2015. <coughs> um, I'm going to try to make this a little bit more interactive. Um, these are a couple questions that we have, um, but also wonder if anyone had a, a question or a, a thought um, that they'd like to ask any of the panel at this time. I know Melanie is in the back. For anyone who is on Zoom, and I see Sarah and Wayne and Bill Reimer and a bunch of people on Zoom, if you have any questions, please type them into the chat box on Zoom, and uh, Melanie will try to pick those up. And uh, for those on Periscope, my iPhone is right next to the wall, and your questions will go, unfortunately, unanswered at this time. But I will uh, put the uh, presenters emails on uh, the slideshow here and you'll have a chance to follow up with them individually which would be great. So any questions from the floor here or comments? Yeah? Um, I don't know who it's directed to, be to anyone, um, but there's a lot of talk about policy or guiding policy makers. This is my area, science communication or research communication to politicians and bureaucrats and policy makers. Is there any indication that policy makers are in fact using the RPLC? to guide policy, and if so, how are you, you know, tracking that or monitoring or engaging, whether or not? And then what about on the other aspect of that in terms of informing the electorate? So they're a big driving force for policymakers and for politicians. Does this feed both of those avenues, or is it more geared towards a more um, academic or a more intellectual crowd? 
Yeah. I know I have one, but go ahead. <laughs> I mean, with the RPLC, it's also pretty early on. It's been uh, going for a couple of years. Um, but having said that, uh, you saw the, uh, the document that was um, put up on the State of Rural Canada. So uh, in that, there are several policy recommendations. And I know that we, as much as we could um, during the election debates, we actually got uh, that State of Rural Canada report out and engaged in a lot of different uh, local debates across rural Canada. Um, we also use the Canadian Rural Revitalization Foundation's annual um, conference as a way to connect many different stakeholders. And so that could be um, uh, federal, provincial, local governments. Um, when the conference was in Prince George, for example, we had um, Western uh, Development, uh, uh, Western Economic Diversification was there, uh, CMHC, um, Stats Canada, uh, lots of different provincial um, ministries as well. And uh, we had planners that were there um, as well, because often they have to get their learning credits. And so they actually used the conference as a way to get some of their professional learning credits. Um, and so, uh, and then just ongoing, um, and this maybe is jumping ahead a, a, a little bit, but uh, you know, we've used some of our research as well to inform some of the work being done by the BC Natural Gas Workforce Strategy Committee. So uh, with all of the talk of LNG, they're very curious of how, what's going to happen and how we can have better practices to guide industry, work camp, and community relationships. Because typically, um, you know, typically work camps would be in quite remote locations. Um, but in the context of the, uh, the Northwest or even with Site C and Peace, the work camps are quite close to communities, and that's a very different dynamic. And so they are very interested in uh, any research and information that we could provide, put forward in order to change investments in policies and programs. Sure. I have, a, I have an example too, if that's okay. I know um, in Manitoba, uh, there was a forced amalgamation from uh, the government, and I know uh, Bill Ashton, who works with the Rural Development Institute of Brandon, um, was consulted on how they should go about the amalgamation. Uh, there was discussion on looking at the population as far as service areas are concerned, um, and trying to think through some logistical ways in which amalgamation would occur. Amalgamation was um, kind of enacted because they wanted to help make uh, governance a little more efficient and also to improve, I guess, general delivery of services. Um, so any population under a thousand had to amalgamate with another community. Um, it was a top-down approach. Not all municipalities were cool with it. Um, many of them fought it. And um, the, the end result is from that consultation with some of the information that we gave to the policymakers is some of the things we're taking into consideration, not all of them. Um, it's a complicated process because amalgamation isn't solely based on service areas or economic areas alone. Um, sometimes there's some traditional, this community doesn't get along with that community kind of thing that you have to get through, you know, the cross town rivals or whatnot. But uh, I know that's one example, recent example that occurred in the last uh, couple of years. And also, just this year as well, I know um, there's presentations made to governments in PEI, Nova Scotia, and Brunswick on immigration. Um, just because I live in Manitoba, I know that uh, a lot of Manitoba's economy has really relied on immigrants to come in to help uh, boost our, our services in our industry. And through that experience, that was shared with policymakers in other provinces as well. So that's just a small scale. I know that there's international comparisons that happen a lot, and um, I guess without, I'm not saying that without the RPLC, no ideas would be shared, but it definitely, I help think, feeds it and helps, because um, like I said before, I think the information is out there, and at least now perhaps, um, and the RPLC is new, but hopefully by the end of this seven year process, it will develop into something that will be seen as where you know, policy or government people can go to to turn to to get that information to make informed decisions. Any other, anyone else have some recent examples? I, I was, I was going to sort of, on a broader, uh, broader generalizable point about research, I think it's important to understand sort of how you want policy to be to be implemented, uh, to, be, to be changed, excuse me, so in, in my sort of, uh, in asking what we've got, why I do you know, drinking water research and stuff, 
there's a lot of things that I could, you know, uh, recommend to the to policy makers that they should be doing or they they they, they should do. Um, and ultimately, that those arguments tend to come down to uh, ones based around uh, monetary reasons. You know, like you should be doing this because you know it's better for public health or it's better for infrastructure or it's better to meet regulation or whatever. But nine times out of ten, they come down to monetary considerations, and it's very easy, I think. As a researcher talking to policymakers, the policymakers to sit back and go, well, we don't have the money for that now, we've got to review, et cetera, et cetera. But I think a better way in, in those cases for research to go at it is to, is to provide a, a, an alternative working methodology that, not that sort of keeps the state, not necessarily keeps the status quo, but keeps sort of the general organization uh, that's in place you know, there, but just changes how, how, those, how those processes are carried out. So, in the case of drinking water example, that would be changing the way that um, engineers and designers and uh, policy makers uh, create infrastructure or uh, work with communities to create infrastructure that provides a, a more meaningful solution for the communities. Um, we've, we've made the salute, we've made the change, we've made the policy change, but the research has impacted policy in a way that doesn't uh, sit behind policy makers should do something. Any other question? Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, now that I've seemed to be identified as uh, an employee of the provincial government, uh, <laughs> it's out. Um, yeah, you're not on camera though, so they don't know who you are. Just hear my voice. It's um, an anonymous government so, employee. Uh, for those of us who have made the transition from academia to, you know, the outside world, uh, such as myself, um, how can I leverage, you know, this this network of resources in my own, you know, like day-to-day -day duties like I I don't make decisions about policy you know I do the busy work that eventually makes its way up the line I don't sign off on these things so how can I use this resource to kind of help uh, the, the development of policy from you know the peon level as I like to say you know up to the uh, you know the executive directors the ADMs and politicians or is it too early in this uh, uh, project to really I, I have a thought, but I'll let well, well, I, I will say that a, a very good idea would be to uh, go and see the, the ELC website and, and check all the things that, that has been done. Uh, one of the things that I think that sometimes we, we miss is the articulation between uh, what's being done in research and, and the, uh, the actions that politicians or people who are in, in places so they can take decisions to to have to be on the same uh, level of, of uh, knowledge that this is happening and because I know that sometimes uh, government uh, asks for uh, custom-made research. We, we need to know this and, and they, they found you to do that. But sometimes something more is happening and I think that, uh, it, it's my, my thought, I, I, I cannot assure that, but it's like you know, they, they are not being aware that they, there are information a good idea to go and check there because there are different, as uh, Michael explained, different sources, ways of following to be updated. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I don't think it's a, a quick process, um, but I think uh, I, we also have to really value um, the potential of our local government partners and um, partners in the communities. Um, when we've done projects, um, we've actually very purposely at the back of the reports, um, we've put little one-pager sort of policy briefs, and we've had our local government partners take those to the Union of BC Municipalities and advocate with ministers uh, and say, this is really what is affecting us, and this is the recommendations that we need. And collectively, when you have a group of them doing that, uh, it really helps to um, start to push for change. Um, so that's, uh, that's definitely one thing. But also with the service providers, um, they're seeing the research results on the ground that we provide to them. And whenever they are negotiating um, through their uh, RPFs uh, with their contracts, they're actually advocating for change even through those contracts now. Um, we've talked to service providers who are saying, well, you know, they're trying to advocate for what we call accordion services because a lot of these small rural and remote you know, communities have boom and bus economies. And so they're trying to see a change in the way 
things how policy plays out to how programs uh, are delivered and how contracts are negotiated. And so sometimes that's another avenue of getting in there. So. Uh, I think actually that being uh, being at the peon level as you describe, I think actually puts you in the best place to leverage uh, research because you are in the fortunate position of having been a researcher and now be be a policymaker. That you know, I don't necessarily understand what your boss or your boss's boss is going to want to see on a piece of paper mm -hmm. or how he's going to want to see it laid out, or whether he wants to enjoy. A 25-page paper, as I do, or whether he's going to want to see, uh, you know, four sentences. That's all I want to know. So if you, I think, in the position you're in, you can tell us, as researchers, you know, great work. You know, I really enjoyed reading that 25-page paper, but I can't take this upstairs. What I need from you is X, Y, Z. Turn it into a flowchart. Turn it into a bubble diagram. Turn it into, you know. Musical, I don't know, whatever it is, but <laughs> help us, help us to, and you know, I don't want to use the, you know, the, the old slogan of help us help you, but it's, I think someone in your position is in the best place to leverage research for, for whatever it is that you need the research to do for you. I want to comment on just a couple of things. So I see we have a question in the back. Um, I worked seven years in government, and it was a great and an eye opening experience. And policy usually only occurs in two t instances. If it's an outdated policy, and say it's 20 years old and they need to update it, or if it's in response to a, a recent uh, you know, crisis like uh, immigration and the international. Um, because sometimes those policy reviews, governments sometimes are reluctant to do them because it usually comes back, they'll do a review, and then of course we need more money. That usually what happens. So, especially because of the recession recently, I know sometimes. There was a slight reluctancy to do policy, but um, that being said, um, when I mentioned that the RPLC is in its infancy, I didn't. Maybe that's a, not the greatest use of words because I see it as a network that has even greater potential than what we've already accomplished. Because as Linamar mentioned, there are a lot of resources that have been collected already in our two years a number of resources comparative, uh, both nationally and internationally, that might be of use to you. Um, I mentioned the, and Linamar mentioned, the notion of really being able to find key threads of information or topic areas of interest that might be of interest to you. And Henry made a great point that, you know, you're, you're in a real ideal situation. And uh, just an example with the, you know, the immigration um, example I had for the other provinces, because we already have started and have, have a collection of information and resources already under our wing, um, we have been called upon already for other provinces and jurisdictions to call us on, on policy recommendations. So that type of work is happening right now, um, and maybe uh, you'll find a way to work it into what you're doing right now as well. Okay, Laura? Oh, <laughs> maybe, maybe. I just had one thing. In addition to kind of following themes or threads for like reports or resources in that in that way, the team supports have also gathered a lot of information on the research areas and the projects that researchers are working on right now. There's actually like profiles of researchers so you can find not only what is being done on a certain topic, but who is working on it and contact that person directly. Yeah, that's great. That's a great point. So if you find and you find it's all very open. Directly contact them, ask them, you know, more information. Uh, question in the back. Well, it's actually a comment from Bill. He was. Bill? Saved. Of course, Bill. <laughs> hey, Bill. I'd be surprised if he didn't have a question. <laughs> um, with regards to this transition, um, so strategy is to identify those people who have the policymakers and peers and then collaborate with them. And so. Oh, okay. That's all comment. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Bill, uh, who's online on Zoom right now, I noticed he's. The director for RPLC, so that's his uh, comment, which is great. Okay. Uh, how are we for time, by the way? It's uh, Okay, good. Um, other questions online or, or from the floor? Good. So, um, any, oh, yeah, in front. So, how would um, a budding researcher or somebody who would be sitting here or listening in 
how would they become involved as a contributor to our PLC? How did you get involved, Henry? Because <laughs> uh, Henry just recently came on, and I, I didn't mean to put you on. No, 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 it's, it's fine. But I, I just like I know my, how I got involved, but um, you know, I'll also instead of hearing me talk all day. Yeah. Uh, so, okay, the, the easy answer is my boss sent me an email and said you should apply for this. And then I did and I got to sit here. Um, the broader point is that my, my research was putting me in, I, I let my research pull me in a number of different directions. And I was involved in my research team as much as I could be beyond just where my research um, was taking me. And then, so that sort of, got me to the point where I became aware of our PLC. And then it was just a matter of waiting for an opportunity like this to to come up. So I think to answer the question of, you know, how do you get involved, I think just just ask the question. You know, I think I just start looking at looking at things that looking at organizations and researchers that are doing similar work to you or work that is going to intersect your work at some point and and just send emails and talk to your, you know, as a researcher, talk to your boss who potentially is in a better place than you are to send the, the email of, you know, hey, I've got a student, the student must be involved, you know, you do me a favor. And, you know, it's a level above me that I would don't necessarily have an access door to. Um, so, I, yeah, that's sort of the way that I became involved. I think it's a way that I became involved in a number of different things that mirror our PLC, just being aware of your environment tap into it and just, you know, I don't think any, I haven't met a researcher yet who doesn't like getting an email that says, hey, can I be involved, or I really like what you're doing, tell me about it, or, you know, I mean, we're, we're all uh, very uh, egotistical people, we like standing in front of people and saying, this is what I do, and aren't I brilliant for doing it, so uh, I think definitely as a, as, as a younger, as a sort of entry level researcher, somebody who's just getting started, that's, that's the way to get involved in it. Um, my my involvement, I started when I was working in government, I we got a couple emails about some webinars. And that started the ball rolling for me. And how anyone can be involved is, and it's, it actually is almost a two-way street, because how can we attract people to us, and also how do we promote ourselves to others? Because it's hard to get people who have rural interests, or, or they might not even realize that our PLC exists, right? So it's a little bit of a two-way street of, you know, how do people find out about us, but also how do we promote to outside. I know um, for anyone who's interested to be involved with our PLC, on our website we have a number of topics that just join in the conversation. We have sometimes uh, an ask open blog session where if you have questions on a certain topic, uh, the last one that they ran was for the SURF conference in PEI, and that gave them involved. Uh, we help promote events such as SURF for opportunities for you to network with other individuals, um, call for proposals, uh, research um, opportunities, career opportunities. All of this we start to, we're starting to feed more into the website uh, with hopefully potential for developing supports for emerging professionals as well. This is also another side project that I didn't highlight here today, but something that um, hopefully down the road is something that we can do to encourage people to get more involved especially new people to the RPLC. Okay, yeah, question there. Uh, yes, uh, so I noticed that RPLC is a seven-year project. Um, yeah. Um, so I might, I, I want to just highlight something about Canada that I know this is exactly what I'm switching. I've been part and I'm part of probably four networks like this that are funded by the council. Mm -hmm. And how we fund science in Canada is that we fund seven years Um, 
Uh, I'll comment one thing is that I know for some research projects in Canada, uh, I'd be happy to have seven years. Some research projects are a lot shorter than seven years. Sometimes even, it's the nice thing about a seven year window, and it's thankful that Shirk has done that, is that does allow for changes in government. Uh, sometimes you get funding based on current governments, and when the current governments change, funding changes, but uh, that seven year window does allow for a longer period to gather that information, and you are right. Um, I don't know that I have the answer of what will happen after seven years, if it'll be an entity that'll exist on its own, um, will be self-sufficient, um, that would be ideal. Uh, definitely, I know everything as far as information is concerned has been collaborated, and that should be available for future generations as well, so that's a great point. I mean, the one good thing, though, uh, the RPLC, kind of, I mean, Bill's online, so he could always add a, <laughs> a comment, too, but a lot of people who are engaged in the RPLC were engaged with the New Rural Economy Project. So those people really did stay connected, and, uh, and they were also engaged with the Canadian Rural Revitalization Foundation. So regardless of what happens at the end of the seven years, oh, yeah. I mean, there's potential to apply for another grant, and maybe it'll go on. Right. But, um, you know, uh, Certainly, SERP would never see everything collapse. You know, I mean, I'm sure that there would be arrangements that you know, you know, on that kind of a front, or um, you know, I mean, I'm sure that the network will stay in, in contact in some way. Yeah. It'll be like Facebook, and then we'll sell advertisements inside, <laughs> and it's going to be the hottest thing. We should totally get involved. That's <laughs> it. Um, that's why they bring me along, just for levity every now and then. Um, untimely. I, and thank you for your question. Did that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, it's really interesting. It's just in science, when you start navigating these grants and things, you always see all the deadlines and years, and you're like, okay, so I really have to think my research questions in function of the time I have. Yeah. Um, and that's something just to look at my as a young scientist, that's really something that I think about a lot. Yeah. I think for me as well, I, I find that I get so focused on what I'm researching that it's hard to find the time to to look for more information that's related to what I'm doing as well. You know, like you, you do tend, and I know a couple of you have mentioned, you kind of go from grant to grant sometimes, holding money, but you kind of lose perspective of how it fits into everything. So, that's a good question in the back. Or, or comment from Wayne. From Wayne, yeah. Uh, networking. Benefits and connections to other research through RPLC is very beneficial. And it's been a huge benefit to him in his own PhD studies, helping to connect him with small field researchers who are focusing on rural broadband in Canada. And so and RPLC helped make those connections that uh, Bill mentions. Bill talked, and Bill had a comment just earlier about um, using your research skills to find out who's working in an area you like read their material, contact, contact them directly, or ask someone to make that introduction, and that RPLC can make those introductions. Oh, yes, for sure. Well. Certainly. And, and you know, a lot of those events and stuff that we do, um, there's lots of opportunities for that. Yeah. I think there's also a, a piece of, uh, like, a, like, a strategy and an accountability that goes along with being a researcher on a grant to to, as you say, you know, figure out that you've had seven years or you have four years, however long it is, and be accountable to that time. So when you're writing your research goals and you're writing your research proposal, have things that you can do in the first year, you know, and, you, and, you, and the, at the end of that first year, you can demonstrate that you have done, and they have things that you can demonstrate that you've done at the end of the grant, so that when you are, you know, when that grant comes to an end, and you're looking for either continuation same organization, or you're looking for a new grant to support what you've already set up, I think having this this accountability and this, uh, this strategy, you know, almost a portfolio that says, okay, over seven years you gave me X number of dollars, and before we even got out of the first you know, quarter, I've been to all the communities I said I was going to go to, and I started half my interviews. And I think being able to show that you, as a researcher, are you know, researching, you know, way that demonstrates responsible use of the money is something that I've noticed both funders appreciate 
and then going to new organisations. You know, if you've got one government fund and you go to a different government department, you go to private industry for money, and being able to show that you can use research money effectively, mm -hmm. I think that's a big piece that helps not necessarily keep the money going, but keeps your research going. And it helps to strengthen relationships with communities too. I mean, I, I know we're going to get into the adjustments here quick, probably, but you know, I mean, if, if you can go and say to a community, we've got these research results, here's some immediate things that you can do as a result of it. If you break it down to those short, medium, and long term actions, they'll be able to see that there's tangible change that's possible. And uh, it makes it them, them more likely to stay engaged with a, a research network as well. So. Also, just segue, I was going to ask, so do you have any fun stories of research that you've done, but things that you kind of had to adapt to how you do things, especially with a northern perspective? Yes, yeah. So um, I know that you have all got the, the little flyer on the doing community-based research. Uh, so this, this book, uh, it's going to come out next year from McGill Queen's University Press. And so there's a website on the back that you can use to um, uh, to order if you like, uh, um, but it's really, really good. It's not a methodology book, so it's not about how to do interviews um, or you know like how to do qualitative versus quantitative that kind of a thing. It's really about developing those um, relationships, and it really does get at some of the uh, idiosyncrasies or some of the unique things that need to be thought about when doing research in rural and remote contexts. Although many of the lessons are also equally applicable in urban settings. So it'll talk about you know how do you develop those relationships before you even get into the field. So there's you know a whole section on before the field, when you're in the field, and also after the field. And then how do you mobilize that knowledge into policy and practice as well? Um, so we've had to learn so many things. Um, you know it's very rare uh, as as a rural geographer, it's very rare that we go into a community where everything has been quite been no change. Often when we are going into a community, it's because there's been a mine closure announcement or mill closure announcements, or there's a boom you know, with the LNG. So there's tremendous stress and change in the community. So two quick examples. 2001, um, there was the announcement of the mine uh, closures in Tumblr Ridge. We were going in to do a community transition um, survey. You have to be so sensitive because literally there are moving trucks like every second or third house. And people are saying goodbye to their friends, and there's a huge amount of stress. Same thing, opposite. You look at Kitimat uh, in the northwest area. Um, lots of speculation because of the LNG stuff, but they also have the Rio Tinto modernization project. There were people from not just BC and Alberta, but from across the country that were literally just arriving with, you know, the whatever they had left in their pockets, um, you know, in hopes that they were going to be able to get a job. So all of a sudden there was this huge influx of people uh, and they had to um, provide assistance. And so the service providers were stressed. The housing infrastructure was stressed. And so therefore you also have a very small complement of uh, local government staff uh, and people that are trying to resolve these kinds of issues. Uh, and so you have to be very mindful, I guess, and respectful of their time. Um, we also talk about the need to recognize the, the rhythms of a community. Uh, for example, you never go and talk to a farmer when it's haying season, you know, or you know, it could be hunting season, or it could be the peak of a tourism um, season for, for a tourism operator, and if they've only got a two-month window to make most of their money for the year, it's probably not the best time to go. Um, we uh, talk about, of course, you know, we mentioned the challenges of distance and isolation, um, but it's not even just the cost of getting there, but you have to understand what happens in these communities. If it's a booming resource town, um, you can't expect to make your field logistic plans three weeks out because likely you will call and they will say there's no rooms left anywhere near Kitimat or even in Terrace and you're going to have to be commuting much further. So you have to understand the context that's going on. Um, we heard a little bit about confidentiality in the previous workshop. Same thing goes, uh, you know, uh, people wear multiple hats uh, and so uh, it's very uh, challenging to try to protect, uh, to protect the confidentiality of uh, some, some of those people, but equally you have to understand the power dynamics because they have strong social networks. Um, sometimes you'll go in and they'll say, oh yeah, talk to so-and-so and so-and-so, and you're like, oh great, they've given me everybody I need to talk to, 
That might not be the case. They may have just given you their inner circle. So you have to really dig deep. You have to make sure you're getting a good comprehensive picture. Um, and I think the other thing that we always talk about is the need to build um, capacity. Um, we, the one good thing about SERP actually uh, um, is they always try to have uh, conferences in um, smaller cities or in uh, small locations. Um, even though smaller communities tend to have more limited infrastructure, sometimes that infrastructure is also underutilized when it comes to rural conferences. You know, we still see where there's conferences and larger you know, centers and uh, um, it's nice to give back and to give back to rural communities in that way. Um, but again, limited transportation uh, infrastructure, meeting places, limited daycare. So if you're trying to organize you know, uh, an open house or a focus group event, um, you know, that, uh, that might be impacted by some of those supports available in the community. And you might have to arrange for transportation for some of your participants from daycare, those kinds of things. So um, I'll stop there because I can go on and on and on. But the book really does get into it. And what's really nice actually is there's also little vignettes from researchers uh, in the Arctic. Uh, there's vignettes from researchers that do rural research from all over the world, Australia, uh, Ireland, um, uh, all over the place. So uh, there's some very interesting um, insights there. I'll stop there. <laughs> Anyone else have an interesting story? Uh, while you were talking about the challenges, I was also thinking, is there anything fun or anything that makes you, why you do it? I know maybe you mentioned about the youth thing. Like what even, what stories do you have? What, what's, why, why rural even, or, or what the adjustments between rural and rural, other types of research? Yeah, well, what's fun about my research is <clears throat> there's so much conversation about young people in rural communities about out migration and they're not being things that when someone comes in, it's, you know, why are you here? What do you love about it? They get really excited. Um, and especially when it's a peer who also lived, or I don't live in rural Nova Scotia right now, but who grew up in rural Nova Scotia and, and loved it. And so that part was really, really positive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What else have you I think one of the, so clearly I'm not, I'm not Alaskan and I'm growing up in the UK, I'm not rural either, so. You're uh, Alaskan. Yeah, almost. Yeah. Uh, I think one of the big things that I had to quickly realize and understand and just put always at the front of my research was that I think any of us as researchers, we're always a guest in the place that we're researching. Mm -hmm. um, and that means you have to you have to come with you know the respect of that guest. And one of the sort of little taglines that I have uh, on the questionnaires that I've been using is, is listen first and question second. Um, because I made I made the mistake in my very first trip of uh, going to talk to a, uh, an operator who was born and raised in the community that I was that I was in, and he'd taken over that job from the guy who had previously done it. He knew everything about that system. He could dismantle it in 30 seconds and put it back together again in 50. Uh, but he had not been anywhere else in Alaska or really, you know, anywhere else in the world. And I came in with a, you know, very well put together questionnaire and I started at one and one A and I was like, right, what's the answer to one A? And that was such a unnatural way of communicating to him that it put him in the frame of, you know, I was um, I was accusing him, I was I was uh, you know interviewing him in a way that put him on the back foot. Mm -hmm. um, and that also violated my sort of List for first question, second policy. So uh, the next time I went to a community, and actually the next time I saw that saw that operator, um, I just said, you know, show me your system. And, and as you say, you know, they, the people that are in these in these in these communities and, and in in the north and in, in rural environments are just really excited to tell you about. Them. And to have someone come in and just say, hey, you know, what 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 do you know? You know, what can you tell me about you know about this? Um, and from and just from having that conversation, you get a guarantee you will get 90% of all the questions you have in your questionnaire just by having that conversation. And the ones that you don't get, it's really easy just to be able to say, well, that's really interesting, but what do you think about? And it's it's a it's an easy conversation to have. The it's it's a pleasant conversation to have as a researcher. And I have always found that I have uh, a lot better buy into the process um, doing it that way.
we had we had a fun. This was this was probably one of my one of my most favorite um, uh, projects uh, when we were up in Tumbler Ridge and we were doing a, a senior needs um, study. Uh, a lot of resource towns were designed and built for young families, as you know, and so now that um, we have a lot of aging that's happening in place, uh, it was one of the communities that really wanted to take a look at that particular topic. Um, but uh, people didn't want to just be bystanders, they really wanted to be engaged and involved. And so we actually got together with the seniors and we trained them. It was all part of our ethics research process and protocol and everything. And uh, they went door to door with us doing the surveys. We'd all team them up and they worked with the high school leadership class. And so you also had this intergenerational sort of learning that was going on. And uh, it really allowed, when the community saw that it wasn't just researchers going door to door, but it was also the seniors and the youth. It really became a community effort, and there was mm -hmm. great buy-in. And then people really wanted to see everything acted upon, and they were much more supportive mm -hmm. um, to have their local government investing dollars in certain things, because they really saw that it was very much um, something that the community owned. They owned the process, right from designing the questions all the way through to the end as well. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's exciting. I was thinking the same thing when you were speaking as well, Henry, that, you know, and I grew up in a small town like many possibly did at that, the, what they call it field theory, social field theory in a small town is so tight that if you can really get into that, in those situations, that's so exciting, that buy-in, it's fantastic. Well, um, I have an experience that when we assume uh, certain things, uh, I remember we, we did a very small uh, research in uh, uh, around Sherbrooke, I come from uh, living in Quebec, and uh, we, we, uh, we are saying that people, uh, Workers, the agricultural foreign workers, they, they don't have a place where to to go and have some kind of a, another activity different to work. And, and we were criticizing that, and we went uh, we went directly. And people say, well, but we don't have also because uh, you know that uh, they caught really with uh, religion. So before it was uh, the church where people was. Uh, having meetings and now they don't have a place where, where to meet. And another thing also it was the fact that I remember once uh, we went with a, someone, a man was accompanying me and we were uh, with uh, two or three farmers, all old farmers, and they are not used to speak with a woman, I think. Oh, yeah. Well, all the time he was watching the other guy. He, oh, he was only driving me. And, uh, but he was like, like doing the, the uh, say, say, I was like that, well, taking off, it was okay, but that thing that we assume when we talk about cultural things, the yeah. difference uh, that we forget, mm -hmm. that uh, there, are, there are things that we need to think uh, uh, previous to, to being in the, in the place, you know, that can make the difference of having your information, as uh, he was saying about, uh, but we cannot take more than an informal conversation than when we are applying the question. Mm -hmm. and, and for me, those little bits of information are so fascinating. And for maybe a young researcher, you know, that that's of interest. If it's something that they, you, you never thought until you were there, maybe. But then, of course, it's like an aha moment, and it can guide other people that you know might be doing research in your area, even if it's a a small segment of the population. Probably rewarding knowing that you're making maybe inroads in those communities. Yeah. Well, just kind of another story. This is something where I'm from rural Nova Scotia. Um, in order to kind of get more context into the communities I was studying, I really, um, my personal networks was at such a small place. So, one of the communities I used community bridges as kind of the first one. One of the communities, the community bridgers, was like my mother's second cousin. She <laughs> took me in and like fed me and toured me around the community. Uh, and then in the other community during my focus group, I did offer childcare uh, in the form of my mother. <laughs> um, and she came and her good friend lived two doors down from the fire hall where I was doing my focus group. And she said, Do you mind if I just take your kid to my friend's house? And the woman was like, Oh no, we love. Nancy and Tom, like they're our best friends, take them over. So, you know, there's just like, not everyone probably has that personal connection when they come in, but just having, I don't know, being able to tap into that sense of community, I feel like it's a better, community very welcoming. Mm -hmm. so. It's 
accepting this as an old social. Maybe others have heard, but there's the phenomenon of the come from the waves, right? Um, as as welcoming and as as lovely as communities in Nova Scotia can be, it's not always that way um, when people want to come from away or settle and things like that. And I can see the benefit of you being, oh well, it's so and so's uh, second cousin, or whatever, right? And people would have, were open likely to, to to talk to you, but it might not have necessarily been that way for um, any one of the others sitting here who wanted to go in and ask the same questions. Um, so that's just another consideration, right? That's that's kind of an Nova Scotia thing, right? Good or bad? Yeah, question in the back. Um, I'd say it's probably a rural northern thing to a certain extent. I mean, I've been doing research in my community in Whitehorse, and it's a different kind of thing when I live there and I have ongoing relationships with people I've heard. Um, I wonder if the RPLC has any interest in developing capacity in rural places for people who live there. I mean, I know you were talking about, that was great hearing about getting the seniors and students actually doing but yeah, there, there is something to be said for the research actually. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the voice and the ideas coming. Yeah, it's, I, I think part of the purpose too is not only a collaboration of information, but I know when I came into it, it's also building capacities, not only in the communities, but out of the researchers themselves too. So some of the opportunities to go to conferences or attend sessions and, and talk with those other people isn't isn't only for the community benefit alone, it's, it's also to help develop, you know, uh, the researchers from that perspective as well. That we're more than happy to expand the net and, and bring in more people and, and talk about ways in which we can make this uh, more rich, fulfilling uh, network. So thanks for that. Um, because we mentioned a couple things on um, things to learn from other people, and I know we're, we're starting to get towards the end of our session here. Um, if it's okay, I'm gonna go into a couple slides that kind of touch on some things that are a benefit in specific to uh, training and mentoring. And these are some things, just some outlines that I know the RPLC has. So we do have memorandums of understanding to rec recognize academic credits, credits amongst participating universities towards graduate degree requirements. Um, they're developing a new comparative rural policy study abroad program so students can spend an academic term at host institution in a partner country to start study comparative rural policy. Uh, I know iServes is also interested in developing a credit-based graduate certificate comparative rural policy targeted at professionals active in rural policy information, uh, increasing cooperation and exchange among partner researchers and academic institutions, increased collaboration with national and international research centers, government and other agencies and partner countries. I have a couple slides left. Uh, also plan to integrate a web-based platform for international comparative research methods and findings, teaching and professional development tools. So that's what I mentioned about, it's, it's also about professional development for researchers. And internship opportunities. Um, develop new networking opportunities for students, faculty, and policy analysts in such international agencies as the OECD and the United Nations. Expand the RPLC partnership to a new national and international institutions and agendas and to train more than 500 students and professionals within the project activities. So it is a broad, but yet very exciting um, thing. I'm glad to be a part of it and glad that everybody's here. Uh, this is just a quick mention of the original RPLC founders. There's 32 of them. There's a number of institutions um, from those nine countries that I mentioned. Um, lots of universities from coast to coast and uh, international. Uh, your university might be here and we also are welcoming more founder or more partners to uh, our umbrella, such as Incomes and uh, everybody else. 
that kind of brings us to the end of our session, I think. Yes? You're looking at me with a question. Did I miss anything? No, I think if I were just going to maybe leave it as a final um, thought, yeah. I think sometimes as researchers, uh, especially as researchers that grow up in more rural areas, we underutilize that living experience mm -hmm. as a skill. So, uh, and I think it's something that we need to promote more as we're engaging in research and with other research teams. So, um, for example, uh, you know, we were going to do some interviews with uh, workers in different mines, and uh, they were very hesitant to let, you know, an academic researcher from an urban area, you know, come out and chat with their workers, because some of those workers are, um, they have, you know, they're more low skilled or they don't have as much education. So once we explained to them, you know, that uh, our family backgrounds, you know, metal salvage operations, forestry, mining, work camp, you know, we had parents that did these kinds of things, and you know, we had experience doing these kinds of things, they were a lot more open to engaging that. So I think if I were to leave with one message, it's to, um, to make sure you utilize that rural living experience as a skill and as an asset. Yeah. Anyone else with some final thoughts? One final thought is that rural research doesn't necessarily have to, or being a rural researcher doesn't necessarily have to come with that title of, of rural research. Uh, right now the research that I'm involved with is not necessarily rural or urban, it's kind of pan-provincial, and I think having someone on a research team or in a government or on a policy development group that kind of has that rural lens and brings that to the conversation even if it's not necessarily a rural project is really important to think of some policy. And so as Michael said at the beginning, a lot of that policy and those conversations are not necessarily said that they're going to come from the city or they're about the city, but they just happen that way because everyone involved is that that's their experience. So bringing that rural experience as a researcher and as someone from rural uh, places is really important. I will say that we need to remember that Things that we need to, in an everyday basis, come from the rural areas. Mm -hmm. We tend to forget to come from there. And sometimes people feel, I feel like a rural, like it was something less important in cities, and I think it's the total opposite. Uh, I, I guess I have a, 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 a major final comment. I guess the thing that I have. Uh, the, my research in rural environments has taught me most is that the education I received, and I think this is a, at least a, a generalized point, education I received as an undergrad was very uh, urban centric, was very uh, large populace centric, and I basically had to go into urban research with, um, with a completely open, open mind actually something that is, is very useful to do for anyone um, who's going into rural research and, and, any, and any research to go in with a level of understanding that you probably don't understand anything. I, um, I thank you all for being here. I, I personally, I find this, and I'm glad, like I said, to be here because it's related to my past and my reminisce and I've said my quasi emotional about it, but um, I, I see rural as so intriguing and so rewarding. And even though the population is starting to go towards urban centers and that's where more votes are, I know that policymakers do still need to know that rural does help support everything because I think we still are a resource based economy. That is where the food is grown. Um, they're not built, grown on high rises. And uh, some of the experiences, like maybe you said, you know, that rural lens, you take it wherever you are. And uh, hopefully something like the RPLC in partnerships with other organizations such as ACONS and the Arctic Research Center, and all of our founders, uh, you know, help uh, bring that information forward to make a meaningful difference in the communities that we live in. So thank you everyone for coming. It's good. Thanks. Enjoy, enjoy.
enjoy the rest of your conference. I know that they're expected to have uh, a little over 100 people um, at the conference. This is a pre-conference workshop. Uh, of course, the people who are online can't see that all 115 are here. <laughs> um, but uh, thank you everybody for tuning in. If you want more information or to follow up, please visit the uh, RPLC website, rplc-capr.ca, or just Google the Rural Policy Learning Commons, and uh, you should find our website and contact anyone. Uh, we'd be happy to hear from you. and. Uh, bring you along. Thanks again. Thanks.